It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 82nd Annual Meeting of the American Finance Association and Presidential Address. My name is Jim Schalheim, and I'm the AFA Secretary and Treasurer. I will begin the business portion of this meeting. First, I'd like to recognize the results of the 2021 election. For President Laura Starks, President-elect and 2023 Program Chair, Marcus Brunemeyer. Vice President is Monica Piazzesi. New directors are Camelia Kunin, Michelle Lowry, and Stan Van Neuberg. I'd like to thank the nominating committee and all the candidates who ran for office. Many thanks go to our outgoing board members for their service, Andrea Eisfeld, Anna Pavlova, Ingrid Werner, and David Hirschleifer. This year, the board selected Antoinette Shore to be the new journal finance editor beginning July 1, 2022. Rounding out the editorial team will be JF co-editors, Urban Yarman, Leonard Kogan, Jonathan Llewellyn, and Thomas Philippon. The financial situation of the AFA remains strong. We continue to increase our assets due to the capital gains on the AFA portfolio. Total assets were 27.4 million as of fiscal year end June 30th, 2021. This represents a gain of over 23% from the previous year. Our net income, including investment income and re unrealized capital gains was 5.4 million during the past fiscal year. As the meeting last year and this year are virtual, the AFA did see, save a considerable amount of money without the conference expenses and travel grants. And speaking of meetings, the ASSA plans to meet in person in New Orleans in 2023 and San Antonio in 2024. Finally, I would like to thank all the AFA officers and board members for their outstanding service to the profession. I would especially like to thank our administrative manager, Annette Clark, for all her hard and thoughtful work on behalf of the AFA. I now turn over the annual meeting to the AFA president, John Grant. Thank you, Jim. Welcome everyone to the AFA 2022 meetings. I'd like to begin with a big thank you to Jim Schalheim for his outstanding service to the AFA as Executive Secretary and Treasurer. And let me also extend a big thank you to Laura Starks for organizing an outstanding virtual conference this year. As soon as the announcement was made that the meetings were going virtual, Laura got to work. And along with the program chairs and AFA staff, Laura formed a truly outstanding program and I hope you've already been able to attend some of the sessions and roundtables. I'd also like to thank seven AFA committees that were very active in 2021. These committees play a critical role in moving the AFA through its many tasks throughout the year. First on the list of committees is AFECT, the Academic Female Finance Committee, which was chaired by Manju Puri and vice chaired by Ingrid Werner and this coming year will be chaired by Heather Tooks and vice chaired by Brad Barber. Please visit AFEC's webpage on the AFA site to learn about the many activities AFEC conducts, including a new mentorship program. The AFA has a relatively new committee, CORD, the Committee on Racial Diversity. CORD and the AFA are evaluating the status and opportunities for underrepresented minority scholars in the finance profession. We are grateful to Rohan Williamson, who is the chair of CORD, as well as the other committee members for their hard work in establishing CORD and guiding its important work. Please visit CORD's page on the AFA website to learn more. We welcome input from any of you about how the AFA can facilitate the professional experience of all minority scholars within the finance profession. The Ethics Committee has been chaired by Laura Starks, the Investment Committee by Jim Schalheim, and the Nominating Committee by Laura Starks. A reminder that the Ethics Committee works closely with the AFA Ombudsperson. Please visit the Ombuds page on the AFA website if you experience professional issues 
for which it would be helpful to interact with the AFA ombuds, Francine Montemuro. Two other AFA committees were active this year. The editorial committee, which I chaired, conducted a thorough process to select the new editor of the Journal of Finance, which by now you know is Antoinette Shore. Antoinette and her team take over on July 1st. And finally, recently a governance committee chaired by Laura Veldkamp was formed. As a matter of best practice, this committee is conducting a periodic review of the AFA's governance and bylaws. Thank you to all committee members for your continued hard work. The AFA would like to thank Marty Gruber for serving many years as the AFA representative to the NBER. Marty is stepping down as the AFA representative, but will remain as an NBER emeritus director and advisor to the NBER investment committee. In addition to representing the AFA at the NBER, Marty has served the AFA as president, editor of the Journal of Finance, and two terms as a board member. Marty is also a fellow of the American Finance Association, the Financial Management Association, and the Institute for Quantitative Research in Finance. Please join me in extending a big thank you to Marty Gruber for his distinguished service to the AFA. Also, we are pleased to announce that Maureen O'Hara is the new AFA representative to the NBER. And now I'd like to turn things over to Laura Starks, who will present a report on the 2022 AFA program. This will be followed by a report from AFA Vice President Marcus Brunermeyer, followed by a report from the editor of the Journal of Finance, Stefan Nagel. Hello, I would like to tell you about the 2022 AFA program. There are so many people to thank that have helped with this program. And if you look online, you can find the program report in which I thank them. In particular, though, I would like to thank Annette Clark at the AFA, who handles the conference logistics so expertly. I would also like to thank Marcus Brunemeyer for organizing the PhD student poster session, which be has become a large job with over 311 submissions this year, of which you can see 127 papers that are on the PhD student poster session. Marcus had the help of five individuals who are thanked by name in the online report. I would also like to thank the 74 session chairs who helped organize the program, either through selecting papers and discussants or arranging special sessions. With only 74 AFA sessions, there are not nearly enough to accommodate all of the excellent papers that were submitted last March. In fact, there were 1,868 papers submitted, which was an increase from the previous year and led to an acceptance rate of around 12%. I am sorry that we could not accommodate more papers, but I am pleased by the overall quality of the program that the session chairs put together. And I hope that you agree with what you have seen so far and the papers that will be presented tomorrow. We have 64 regular paper sessions and 10 additional sessions that include two special paper sessions, six panel sessions, the AFA lecture, and the PhD student poster session. The two special paper sessions are sessions that were held open until December in order to present more recently produced papers on emerging topics in finance. Each of these sessions will have five papers presented with no discussants, and they will both be on the program tomorrow at 3.45 Eastern time. ESG is the topic for one session and racial issues in finance is the topic of the other. These topics are some of the most written about topics in finance in the last few months, and there were a large number of excellent papers in these areas that we also were unable to accommodate. There are six panel sessions, four of which have already occurred, but they are recorded so you can still watch them. These panels are Government Debt, How Much is Sustainable, chaired by Annette Physic jordanson Finance and Social Responsibility, chaired by Jonathan Burke, Climate in the Financial System, chaired by Anil Kashyap. Central Bank Digital Currency, chaired by Marcus Brunemeyer. Two of the panels will be tomorrow. How can academic research inform policy on ESG and short-termism, chaired by Scott Bogus, which will be at 10 a.m. And Current Issues in Financial Market Regulation, chaired by Kathleen Hanley, which will be tomorrow at 12.15. I would like to thank these panel organizers for all the work they put into organizing their sessions. Finally, we have the AFA lecture, which was delivered this year by Emmy Nakamura, 
on micro and macro evidence on inflation and monetary policy. I thank Emmy for bringing us new insights into what is currently a very important topic. Again, although that lecture has already occurred, it is recorded and you can watch it online. Thank you very much for submitting your papers to the AFA and for participating in the program. I hope you will submit your papers this spring for the 2023 program scheduled to be held in New Orleans, and I look forward to seeing you in person next January. Hello, I'm uh, Marcus Brunema, and I will uh, talk about the travel grant program and the AFA PhD poster session. So the travel grant program, which is typically awarded to students to attend the AFA annual meetings, won't happen this year this way because we meet virtually again in 2022, and hence the travel grant awards were suspended. In lieu of a special panel for travel grant recipients, the AFA PhD student panel will held, will be held and is open to all PhD students registered for the annual meetings. A special invitation was sent out to the leadership of the PhD project. The AFA PhD student panel will be held on Sunday in the afternoon at the end of the annual meetings. I'm very grateful to Wen Jin Zhu and to Ulrike Malmendia for speaking with me on this panel. Second, I want to talk a few words about the PhD poster session. It's running again the sixth year in 2022, and I'm grateful and thankful to Joseph Abadi, Jonathan Payne, Claudia Robles Garcia, Ishita Shen, Shen Sin Zhu for reviewing and selecting the papers for the PhD poster session. This session was advertised mid June with submission deadline of July 31st, 2021. We received 311 submissions. And 129s were accepted initially for the PhD student poster session. That translates into an acceptance rate of 41%. Last year, we had an acceptance rate of 38% in 2021. Let me conclude by introducing Francine Montemuro, the American Finance Association Ombudsman person, as the next speaker. Hello, I'm Francine Montemuro. I'm the Ombuds for the American Finance Association. The AFA established this role two years ago as a confidential and informal problem-solving resource for members of the AFA. Since then, AFA members have contacted me with a range of conflict situations, most of which so far have concerned the conduct of colleagues or norms and practices at their home institutions rather than with the practices of the AFA itself. A few situations were addressed by simply locating and parsing an appropriate policy, but most involved highly sensitive, multi-party, complex matters that remained challenging to manage and had no simple answer. They included concerns about discrimination and harassment, abuse of power, miscommunication, or research misconduct. My first priority as ombuds is to pro provide a safe space for you to discuss just about any kind of concern you might have regarding AFA core activities, difficulties at your home institution, or issues affecting the academic finance profession more broadly. In part, the ombuds role is intended to identify options for informal early intervention so that you can begin to manage a conflict situation before it can escalate. If you contact me, my first goal will be to take time to listen and make sure I understand your experiences and concerns. Then together we can evaluate the situation and develop possible options for managing it. In keeping with Ombuds principles of practice, these discussions are confidential and the decision as to whether to take action remains yours. For an appointment, just send me an email requesting a time to meet by video or phone conference. You don't need to provide any identifiable or confidential information. To learn more, visit the AFA website. Thank you, and here's to a happy and healthy new year.
I'm going to present the report of the editor of the Journal of Finance for 2021. Let me start by showing you some numbers on the flow of papers that we received. After the huge increase in submissions that we saw uh, in 2020, shown here with the green bar, uh, new submissions fell back a little bit to 1,153 uh, during the past 12 months. Together with revised and resubmits that came back, um, we had a total of papers that we processed uh, of close to 1,300. Turnaround times remain good. We had a median turnaround of 46 days in 2021, uh, just like the year earlier. And also like in earlier years, we were able to keep the fraction of papers that take more than 100 days to be processed uh, to less than 10%. The desk rejection rate shown in the left chart here is very similar to previous years, just about 30%. We did see a substantial change though in the probability of a first round R&R shown on the right-hand side here. And this is partly due to the fact that we re re received a very strong flow of papers this year. Um, but part of the reason is also that at the end of 2020, as I mentioned in my report a year ago, we had a bit of an overhang of pending r and decisions, so this also contributed to a higher r and rate in 2021. One metric that we watch very carefully at the JF is how many rounds it takes for paper to make it all the way through to acceptance. We're trying to avoid uh, burdening authors with many, many rounds of revisions, and we have been largely successful uh, with this in 2021. Among all the papers that got accept, accepted in 2021, uh, close to 60% made it through uh, with only one revision. And more than 90%, as shown in the right-hand side chart here, more than 90% made it through after at most two revisions. This chart shows uh, the number of articles that the JF published in brown compared with the JFE and RFS. So as in previous years, the number of articles in the JF was much lower than in RFS and JFE. We published 72 articles in 2021. Um, however, we have a pretty big stock of papers right now that are accepted, but not yet published. Uh, the stock is much bigger than in previous years. So I'm anticipating that the number of articles that we will publish over the next 12 months will be much higher uh, probably around 90 articles. Um, and so this is probably a substantial increase over the previous years. Here's some data on citations. Um, all of these numbers will be for citations in 2020. This chart shows the number of total citations. And as in previous years, the JF is number two behind the AR. Uh, according to this metric. And in all of these charts, I'm going to compare the JF to the top three finance journals and to the top five uh, econ journals together. Here's a two year impact factor. So this counts how many times on average uh, an article published in 2018 or 19 has been cited in the year 2020. And on this metric, the JF is number four after the QJE, AER, and JPE, and ahead of the JFE. For the five-year impact factor, so these are um, papers that got published in uh, 2019 and the previous four years, how often they have been cited in 2020. On this metric, the JF is number two after the QJE, just ahead of the JFE. So overall, the JF is in very good shape with a robust submission flow and with very high impact. Moreover, the American Finance Association has also found a great team of new editors to come in and take the reins at the JF next summer. 
It's hard to believe, but it has almost been six years now that our current team of editors has been running the JF, and so it's time for our new team to step in. The incoming executive editor Antoinette Choir has put together a great team of co-editors with Urban German, Leonid Coben, Jonathan Levellen, and Thomas Philippon. The JF will be in great hands with this new team, and we're going to make sure that the transition will take place uh, as smoothly as possible. Among other things, to ensure con continuity for authors, we're going to, uh, our current team is going to continue to handle revise and resubmits uh, for another 18 months to make sure that there's no break in the editorial processing uh, of these papers. Running the journal during the past almost six years has been a huge collaborative effort and so I'm in big debt to many people who have helped along the way. And first and foremost, I would like to thank my co-editors, Philip Bond, Amit Saru, and Wei Xiong for a fantastic collaboration. Uh, that it has been really a pleasure working with them and still is a pleasure working with them. And it has also been a super intellectually rewarding experience to work with this distinguished team. I would also like to thank our hardworking associate editors who take on a big workload and often provide advice and reports at very short notice. I would also like to thank the many, many referees that have written reports for us over the years, um, many of them writing several reports every year. And then finally, it would be impossible to run the journal without the help of our assistant editor, Wendy Washborn, who keeps the journal running operationally like a well-oiled machine. And now, last but not least, let me get to the best paper prizes for 2021. As in previous years, we have prizes in two categories, the Brattle Group prizes for papers in corporate finance and related fields, and the Dimensional Fund Advisors prizes for papers and asset pricing. Before I show you this year's prize winners, let me say a few words about the selection procedure. The first step is that our associate editors self-select to vote for one or both of these prizes. And then they nominate the top three rank order papers from the December, 2021 to December 2020 to October 2021. And then the editors make the final selection among the highest ranked papers. So let's start with the Brother Group prizes. Here we have a winner of a distinguished paper award. And this is the paper the Limits of Limited Liability, Evidence from Industrial Pollution, and the authors are Pat Aki and Ian Apple. Another distinguished paper award goes to the paper Banking on Deposits, Maturity Transformation Without Interest Rate Risk. And the authors of this paper are Itamar Drexler, Alexei Savov, and Philip Schnabel. And then finally, the first prize winner is the paper Leverage Dynamics Without Commitment by Peter DeMazzo and Shigoha. And now the Dimensional Fund Advisors Prizes. So here we have a Distinguished Paper Award for the paper Monetary Policy and Reaching for Income by Kent Daniel, Lorenzo Galapi, and Kairong Jiao. A second distinguished paper award goes to the paper Stock Market Returns and Consumption. The authors of this paper are Marco Di Maggio, Amil Kamani, and Kabe Mashlesi. And then finally, the first prize DFA paper is the paper Every Cloud Has a Silver Lining, Fast Trading, Microwave Connectivity, and Trading Costs by Andrei Shkilko and Konstantin Sokolov. So let me conclude by congratulating our prize winners and by saying a big thank you to our donors, the Brattle Group and Dimensional Fund Advisors who supported these prizes with a donation of $45,000 uh, from each donor. Good evening, everybody. We turn next to the appointment of the 2022 Fellow of the American Finance Association. Candidates for the appointment to fellow are selected by 
the nominating committee of the American Finance Association, and their slate is then presented to the existing fellows at the FA for a vote to determine who the new fellow will be. This year's fellow has published over 200 articles and 12 scientific books. His research covers the areas of industrial organization, regulation, finance, macroeconomics, banking, and psychology-based economics. He's currently honorary chairman of the Toulouse School of Economics and the 2014 recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics. It is with my great pleasure and honor indeed to introduce Jean Tirole, the 2022 Fellow of the American Finance Association. Well, thank you for the honor. It's a huge honor to have been selected as the 2022 AFA Fellow. The list of previous recipients is truly humbling. I could certainly not have dreamt of such an honor at the start of my academic career, all the more that I didn't take finance as a field when I was a student at MIT. So I really stumbled upon finance several times in my career and came to appreciate its importance for the common good, both in its key contribution and also for its risk. I was lucky in two ways. First, as was the case for my career more generally, I've been very fortunate to meet leading lights who were kind enough to work with me. This award is largely theirs. I was lucky for another reason. Some of the most successful applications of incentive theory lie in finance, both at the micro level, corporate finance, corporate governance, um, banking regulation, and also at the macro level, the credit and lending channel, the transmission mechanism, the liquidity shortages. I just found myself working with Bank Holmstrom on the idea that liquid stock markets facilitate performance monitoring, with Matthias de Watripon on debt and outside equity as a manager on incentive scheme, and also on banking regulation, with Drew Fudenberg on income and dividend smoothing, or with Philippe Aguillon on formal and real control. At the macro level, again, the encounter with great teachers and scholars, together with a change in paradigm, was pure serendipity. As a student at MIT, I took a course with Stan Fisher, who discussed an early paper with Olivier Blanchard on asset, of Olivier Blanchard on asset price bubbles. Stan and Olivier are responsible for my subsequent work on bubbles. I'm a, I am highly indebted to Bank Tomstrom and Emmanuel Fari for joint work on liquidity. This joint work builds on four running schemes. The first is that capital markets are imperfect. Factors such as agency costs prevent the pledging of the entirety of the benefits from reinvestment to outside investors, resulting in illiquidity. So illiquidity is really future credit rationing. In turn, the anticipation of future credit rationing gives rise to a familiar demand for liquidity. Hoardings of stores of values on the asset side, management of the debt level and maturity on the liability side. Second idea, the state is the only possible insurance of last resort thanks to its regalian taxation power. Third idea, public finances are exposed to an illiquid financial system and for good reasons. The state relies on the financial system for the continuity of core services, such as loans to SME and the repayment of liabilities to depositors and to other regulated financial institutions. The exposure, and this is a foresight, the exposures of public finances to the financial system is endogenous, meaning subject to more hazard. And therefore, there is a role for prudential, macroprudential regulation. On a lighter note, having grown up in the Champagne region, the crowning event of my career was a publication in the Review of Economic Studies of a 2012 paper with Emmanuel Fari aptly entitled Public Liquidity. Now, more seriously and beyond the ability to thank some of those who are the real craft persons behind this award, I'm tremendously grateful to the American Finance Association for recognizing me as one of theirs and for the tremendous honor this award is conferring upon me. Thank you.